this proposal will basically eliminate any basis reduction for LIHTC projects who are also claiming, for instance, the 45L energy efficiency credit, as well as some of the Section 48 investment credits. So this is going to allow developers to receive that full benefit from those credits. Welcome to Buzz House, a Baker Tilly podcast where you can find all the buzz around multifamily housing. I'm Don Bernard, the partner in charge of Baker Tilly's multifamily housing practice. And I'm Garrett Gibson, a partner at Baker Tilly, also specializing in consulting on multifamily housing transactions across the country. Each week, we'll bring you a guest or a topic in the multifamily housing industry that will help you win now and anticipate tomorrow. Let's get started. Today on our podcast, Garrick and I will be doing a deep dive into the housing provisions around President Biden's infrastructure plan, which is officially called the American Jobs Plan. As part of this provision, we specifically will be exploring the Affordable Housing Improvement Act of 2021. As there is so much to get into, this is going to be a great discussion. I'm really looking forward to it. Garrick and I are going to dig in to the details. For a quick background, the Affordable Housing Improvement Act of 2021 is Senate Bill 1136, as well as House of Representative Bill 2573. To start out, these are identical companion bills, so 100% identical. As you well know, since 1986, the Light Tech program has financed almost 3.5 million units of housing. Today also, we know that more than 10.5 million renters pay more than half of their income on rent, and that number is only growing. Congress, of course, has not permanently increased the amount of 9% low-income housing tax credit authority in 21 years. And of course, on average, only one of three 9% applications is awarded, showing that tremendous demand from developers and from communities for affordable housing resources. You know, turning turning to that, Garrett, can you tell us about the proposed expansion of the 9% credit? I certainly can, Don. The proposal is to actually increase the amount of 9% allocations by a total of 50%. So this 50% would be phased in over two years with 25% increase in 2021 and the other 25% increase in 2022. So there, you know, the industry estimates that this would basically increase the number of affordable units by almost 300,000. So I think a key in this is, is the units produced by 9% credits is that many of them are actually targeting AMIs well below 60%. So this is definitely a way to hit the 30 or 50% population and their needs. Wow, that would be super, super impactful, super impactful. Garrick, another provision that really caught my eye that really hadn't been on my radar, and I think obviously will help uh, immensely and immediately, is with kind of the rules around acquisition and rehab. And and the 10-year rule, obviously, many people are looking at naturally occurring affordable housing without tax credits, but, you know, a lot of these properties trade, right? They trade, someone might hold them, maybe it's a private equity group or others, they they hold them for three years, five years. And as as our listeners are well aware, you're, you're generally not able to take acquisition tax credits if a property was placed in service within the last 10 years. Of course, again, one major exception, which Congress added in 2018 was for predominantly federally subsidized properties. So Section 8 properties and and properties financed with with HUD financing. Again, Derek, I know we've looked at, you and I have looked at a number of deals recently that, hey, you know, the the deal would have worked if we could have had acquisition tax credits, but they were only maybe acquired three years ago, placed in service three years ago, and and we couldn't get them. Derek, tell us a little bit about this proposed provision. Yeah, certainly. And, and, you know, Don, I agree that this is going to be a great tool, especially in the naturally occurring affordable housing world. And the proposal is basically a modification to the 10-year hold rule where you would be able to now obtain acquisition credits on properties that have been placed in service within the last 10 years. But the acquisition basis is supposed to be limited to the lowest price paid for the building in the last 10 years, plus any additional capital improvements since then. The anti-churning rules, as you may recall, was included in Section 42 as the IRS was concerned about churning real estate to take advantage of the accelerated depreciation rules enacted in 1981. With longer depreciation in effect, it makes sense that this should be addressed. I have looked at many deals that it could have been financially feasible if they had acquisition credits. And as you know, this always comes up 
And every time we're on a call where people are, are looking to at least acquire deal, you know, it's one of the things that, that we're always looking at to make sure that, that the structure is actually going to work. Yeah, those, those are really, really good comments. And, and I'm glad you pointed that out. A lot of times the question comes up, why is that rule even in place? You know, what's it, why is it, you know, it's just hurting me trying to preserve this, but you, you, you mentioned those 1981 appreciation rules and so forth. So I think, I think this would be, again, it's kind of under the radar, but I think it'd be really impactful for a lot of these NOAA deals and, uh, and other um, year 15 deals and things like that. Erica, one, one provision that I was very interested to see, and I'm, I'm working on a, on a panel right now, a, a committee with the city of Milwaukee. And in that panel, it's it's looking at we need so many more lower income units being even as low as 20 percent, 30s, 40s and 50s. And again, how do you do that? Garrick, as you well know, and our listeners, if you have a 30 percent AMI unit, it's barely, if, if at all, covering debt, even sometimes not even covering full expenses. So, you know, I think there's some discussion out there. And, and I know President Biden's campus talked about universal rental assistance. But, you know, maybe another way is to get more tax credit equity into a project which has very you know low income uh, very low income units Garrick, what is what is the kind of this provision maybe maybe around additional boost for lower or deals with uh, lower amis yeah don you know we, we we've we've heard this discussion around the property for a long time and I, you and i've bounced it around it's like how do you generate more units for extremely low income households and well obviously you know, giving a, a larger basis boost would be great, right? So this provision is supposed to provide up to a 50% basis boost. You know, of course, we already have the QCT, DDA, you know, and the for 9% projects, the discretionary boost, which can give uh, up to a 30% basis boost. And, you know, and that's always great because that, that actually makes or break many deals that I know that I'm working on, especially when they have to have a little bit deeper skewed AMIs. And so this provision would apply only to the portion of the development serving 30% AMI units and below, right? So given that, this would be a great sort of use for serving that supportive housing project where perhaps 50% or more of the population or the project is actually serving those 30% AMI units. So, I mean, it's something that I've heard bounced around before, and I think this is a great provision. Yeah, Gary, that's, again, very powerful. All these, all these added together, just tremendous. Derek, you, you just touched on the basis boost and, and states having having discretion, uh, specifically state housing finance agencies currently, of course, can give any 9% deal in their state, the 30% basis boost. And again, regardless if that project lies in a qualified census tract or a uh, difficult develop barrier DDA. Derek, of course, this is not available currently for projects financed with 4% tax credits. And that's obviously, again, as these 4% deals generally harder to put together especially new construction deals. Again, these deals, 4% deals, of course, can receive the boost if they lie in the QCT or DDA. Garrett, talk about the, the proposal around further boost for, for bond deals. Yeah, certainly. I mean, if I had a nickel for every time I looked at the bond deal and said, oh, this would work if we had a discretionary boost, just need a little bit, you know, because it was certainly exciting when the 9% deals received this discretion. And, you know, we've seen a lot of states actually utilize it, right? So, um, the question comes up often, you know, when I'm dealing with, with, with folks trying to, to make a deal pencil out, especially with a drastic rise in construction costs. How do these new construction 4% projects in these sort of minor urban areas or even rural areas or other urban areas that don't really line a QCT and a DDA uh, get completed? Right. I mean, obviously, if it was a nine percent, they'd have some discretion there to, to boost that up from the agency. So this proposal in the Affordable Housing Improvement Act would give the states the authority to allow up to a 30 percent basis boost for any project that is financed on a tax and bond deal or four percent credit, regardless of location in that state. So this will offer basically add a significant amount of new units to be created. So this will be a very exciting provision for the industry as well. Karen, I mean, exactly. I would say very exciting. You know, at the end of the year in January, we talked a lot about the fixed 4%. We're talking about all these just item after item kind of being ticked off. So very ticked off the list. Very, very exciting. Here, you know, we looked at models. You haven't been able to have your cake and eat it too, right? You have energy credits and other things. That credit, if it's 50% or 30% of, you know, maybe the energy credits reduce your light tick basis. And it's like, ah, oh, why can't we... Why can't we marry all these credits together even better? You know, obviously they do work together, right? There we we we've looked at and listeners, you know, 45L energy efficiency credits, maybe some solar credits and so forth. But as you know, in a portion of the tax 
the, the, the solar credits or $45 energy efficiency credits need to reduce your light tick eligible basis. So really this, I think, Garrett, this next provision really looks at how can they, they maybe work together a little bit more efficiently. And I know I was looking at, at that project with you in California that had potentially 45 L credits, but it's like that deal was in a QCT. And if I have to reduce, you know, the, the, the 45 L credits and I lose the, 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 the basis boost, it's, it's hardly, it's hardly worth it. What's, what are you seeing and reading on, on this provision, Garrett? Yeah, so I, I mean, you bring up a good point on, on some of the credits you mentioned because I've been working with 45L credit and, and some of the solar credits for, for quite some time. And I just remember how complicated uh, it was to have to deal with when we were initially dealing with because the basis reduction and was there excess basis. Obviously, if there's a bond deal, you don't, you don't really have excess basis because you're taking the full credit on, on, on the eligible basis that's there. So, yeah, you know, so. We could obviously uh, work on projects that that have these credits on them, at, you know, like 45 dollars solar, and they work together. But those current rules really don't allow you to have your cake and eat it too. I mean, obviously they're trying to push more energy efficiency in in projects, and I think especially in affordable, this would be great, right? Because the netting of those energy credits takes away from the LIHTC eligible basis. And, you know, we often see on 4% deals, we don't have that excess basis, like I mentioned. So this proposal will basically eliminate any basis reduction for LIHTC projects who are also claiming, for instance, the 45L energy efficiency credit, as well as some of the Section 48 investment credits. So this is gonna allow developers to receive that full benefit from those credits and energy credits, right? Affordable and energy credits, as well as incentivize these affordable developers to pursue additional energy efficiency components, which I think all around is a good thing. That'd be great to see. Garrett, you know, as I mentioned just a couple of minutes ago, we've been following the 4% tax credit closely, you know, over the past year, we'll, we'll, we'll get fixed at four, we'll not get fixed at four. Um, so we've been following it, you know, and, and, and we know, Garrett, even, even before it got fixed, there were probably, I don't know, eight, nine, 10 states that were already, fully using all their, their tax exempt bond volume cap. And so, you know, with this 4% fix for those states, even though those projects will be a little bit more financially feasible, the fix four is not necessarily creating more units in those states. And I think another thing we've been talking a lot about is the rise of state loan composing tax credits. I think in, in a recent podcast, we mentioned as many as nine states had proposed legislation, which again would increase the amount of potential bond deals in those states and just more and more activity, which will run in more and more states, you know, running out of a volume cap. So all these great benefits you're talking about, the boost and the 4% fix and, and so forth are not really going to be, be beneficial. Garrick, and, and we, we've touched on this, that this 50% test, right? What, why do we need 50%? It's, it's maybe arbitrary. What, what, what does this, this act the, have a provision around looking at the 50% test? Ah, the dreaded 50% test. <laughs> I know I know we talked about this on the Buzz House before, uh, about this legislation and, you know, and also the dreaded volume cap. If you're in a state that has volume cap, cap issues, then you know what I'm talking about. So as our listeners know, right, in order for a tax-exempt bond funded 4% trend, you know, and in order to get 4% credits, they have to receive these on all the eligible basis, right? So at least 50% of development costs must be funded during construction buy those taxes and bonds with the authority from the state's volume cap. So in many projects, these bonds are just used for construction and then they're just paid off by taxable permanent debt. So the 50% level is sort of really, you know, I wouldn't say necessarily arbitrary, but in a sense it is, right? So as we see more and more states running out of this taxes and bond cap, why is the 50% test coming into play, right? So this provision in the act would only require that 25% of development costs are financed with taxes and bonds. And so there are industry estimates that if they actually pass this provision, then this could generate almost 1.5 million more units of affordable housing across the country over the next decade. And so there is also precedent for lowering this percentage. When the LIHTC program came out in 1986, this is actually a 70 percent test. But people quickly came to the conclusion that these bond deals can't carry that level of debt. So by 1990, this was lower to the current 50 percent. I'm very excited to see this provision. Hopefully, it'll it'll get some legs and take hold because th this is going to free up a lot of that volume cap and, and and likely get a lot more deals done. That was that was really neat that that historical context that this has happened you know once before and I think it's again especially if you know if a lot of people are paying off their bonds you know early why right why do we need so many bonds uh, to begin with? On a very related note, Garrett, there's been. 
discussion, I think for a while, but again, because we've been tight on volume cap about recycling housing bonds. As we discussed earlier, you know, many projects, you know, take out tax and bond financing only to get through place and service. And sometime thereafter pay, pay off those short-term bonds with a taxable permanent debt. And that taxes and bond authority is essentially burned through and cannot be reused. So, you know, it's kind of like wasting it. You use it for 24, 30 months and, and throw it away. As we're in a situation that, that we discussed earlier with so much demand for bonds, the question has come up, you know, why can't, you know, some bond, some bonds are 30 years, you know, why can't we, and if we're only paying off in two, why can't we reuse this bond authority? Garrett, was there a, 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 a quick snippet on, on maybe some recycling of bonds? Yeah, I mean, you basically, you know, hit the nail on the head right there, right? This is really just looking at how can state housing finance agencies recycle these taxes and bonds that have been paid down in just a few years? So one idea is for the state HFAs, many of whom who have robust single family lending programs already could use these recycle bonds for their single family programs. So that will allow the majority of all the new bond authority you know, for the states to be used on the LIHTC projects to meet that demand. So, you know, it's, it's kind of an interesting provision, but but one that I think is also beneficial in its own right. Kirk, I know this was a, a quick snippet. I know it's been just in, you know, back and forth and there's, you know, the IRS has maybe, you know, come out and, you know, in, in some, uh, some authority with this, but just around temporary relocation where, you know, the IRS has, has noted in, in certain documents that the cost for relocating tenants temporarily is, is deductible. We know that relocation costs when relocation is done well and, and safely can, can be quite costly on, a, on an ACT rehab deal. Jared, what does this bill provide around relocation discussion? Yeah, you know, and, and you know, just to, to hit on that, Don, I, I've worked on some deals that have had like a million dollars in some temporary relocation costs because of the type of development that was going on there. So, you know, basically, this bill is simply allowing for the cost of that temporary relocation incurred as a cost to, to get the rehabilitation project completed and therefore should be capitalized similar to the other sort of indirect costs in that rehab project. So this provision would basically put, you know, clarity to a long debated topic, which, uh, you know, basically started when the IRS published that audit guide, which basically stated that they thought it should be deducted. Maybe one last, and it's more of an intangible uh, factor. You know, the name low income housing tax credit program often comes up and and I know for a while, it, you know, the phrase, you know, quote unquote, low income, you know, stands out to NIMBYs. Oh, you're providing low income housing and, and, and the NIMBYs come out. What's, uh, what's the discussion around this in, in the act? You know, it, it, we've seen this, right? I mean, obviously, they've, this was trying to, they were trying to pass this before and it, and, and it didn't go anywhere. But, you know, this provision and this bill is basically, to, like you said, to change the name of the program under Section 42 to the affordable housing tax credit versus the low income housing tax credit, you know, such that, you know, opponents who have this sort of misconceptions about low income projects, you know, may not rise up to the talent, you know, to challenge these projects as quickly. I mean, I mean, if you think about it, I mean, when, when people don't really, you know, know exactly what affordable housing is on the full spectrum, you know, when, when they when they hear low income, they automatically just uh, have this bias of what that really truly is. And I think this would, you know, it would be a step in the right direction to kind of reverse that thinking. Garrett, this is a really, really good discussion. I hope our, our listeners, you know, get out of it. Garrett, put, put you on the spot here. If you had to rank these in priority, according to the Garrick metric, the Garrick rubric, what would you like to see and how would you rank them? <laughs> okay, was this a trick question? All right, I, I, you know, I'll, I'll try. So, you know, actually, I, I would try to rank them, or at least I will rank them, probably in order of which provisions that I think are going to add the most affordable housing units, or at least have the most impact. You know, then again, some of the provisions are there to help target even lower AMIs, et cetera. You know, so that being said, I would I would probably say my first one would be to you know the increase in nine percent credit provision, and then I would go with uh, po possibly the the decrease you know, where they decreased the bond test to 25% to increase the amount of volume cap available for projects, obviously, because I'm a Texan and, and here we have volume cap issues that I think that would help uh, immensely. And then my third, I would say the basis boost increase for, you know, for the more deep skewed AMIs. 
And then I would maybe go with the 10 year hold rule changes and then the discretionary boost that's available, you know, make them available for bond deals. And then, you know, which, which is, you know, interesting provision. I really thought about it too much, but the recycling of the housing bonds. And then, you know, the energy related adjustments for light tech projects would be great too. Definitely relocation cost and basis next. And then I guess the name change. I, I know the name change is probably important for perception. I, I just put it last just because it won't necessarily directly affect how many more units come on. But I, I think it's definitely something that should happen. But that's how I would rank them right now. This is just my rank, my opinion, and others may see it differently. I just think the order I mentioned would probably have the most impact on adding more affordable units in the market. Very good, Garrick. Thanks for that. And, you know, listeners, let, let Garrick and I know how you rank them. Let us know if you want to want to discuss them. And just a lot of really good information, of course, in future podcasts. We'll keep on top of this, what, what the process is overall of the of the infrastructure bill. As I mentioned earlier, you know, will there be more rental assistance potentially available uh, more universally? And with that, we want to thank listeners for tuning in today. Thank you for listening to BuzzHouse. To receive a notification when new episodes are available, please subscribe to BuzzHouse, a Bacon Tilly podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. For additional resources around multifamily housing, check out bakertilly.com. And if you have a suggested topic, please send them to build at bakertilly.com. That's B-U-I-L-D at bakertilly.com. The information provided here is of a general nature and is not intended to address the specific circumstances of any individual or entity. In specific circumstances, the services of a professional should be sought. Tax information, if any, contained in this communication was not intended or written to be used by any person for the purpose of avoiding penalties, nor should such information be construed as an opinion upon which any person may rely. The intended recipients of this communication and any attachments are not subject to any limitation on the disclosure of the tax treatment or tax structure of any transaction or matter that is the subject of this communication and any attachments.